Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're going to be talking about monsters. Now, before we get to our interview, which is very uh, exciting, we just wanted to remind people that we are going to be at the Sound Education Conference, October 9th through 11th, or 12th, 9th through 12th, (laughs) I'm always so prepared, uh, in Boston. And this is a conference for podcasters, but it's also very much a celebration of educational audio in many different forms. So if you're a podcaster, it's it will be great. But if you enjoy listening to educational podcasts, a whole bunch of fabulous podcasters will be there giving talks, especially on the Saturday, the 12th, uh, about their areas of interest and their specialty topics. And you can register now at soundeducation.fm to come and attend. If you're anywhere in the Boston area, or if you can get there, you can come for one or two days. You can buy tickets to individual sessions if you just have one podcaster that you'd love to hear from. Our audience, I think, will be particularly interested in uh, two of the keynote speakers, Mike Duncan of the History of Rome and Revolutions podcasts, and Helen Zaltzman of the Illusionist podcast. So both our history and our linguistic itches will be scratched (laughs) on the weekend. We'll also be running two panels Uh, Well, three panels, I guess. (laughs) One on language. Mm -hmm, That you're running. That I'm running. And I put together a podcast that I won't be moderating, but I put together a podcast on podcasting in the classroom and assigning podcasts as assignments in classes like a classics course or a history course or something for students to do. And then another panel, which I will be moderating on audio and the academic career, talking about the role of podcasting or podcasting adjacent career choices on a more traditional academic career and how we can make those two things mesh and support one another instead of seem in competition. So if you want to come to any of those, those are on the Friday, the schedule and all the other information is at soundeducation.fm. So go check it out. All right, enough of that. Now on to the main attraction today. Today we are talking to Dr. Liz Gloyne. She did her BA and her MPhil at Newnham College in Cambridge and her PhD at Rutgers in the US. She is now a senior lecturer in classics at Royal Holloway at the University of London, where her research interests are Seneca and Stoicism, the history of classics, and classical reception. And it is this last interest that has led to the book that we're talking about today, Tracking Classical Monsters in Popular Culture from Bloomsbury, coming out on Halloween, a perfectly appropriate date. Now, to quote from the publisher, In this book, the first in-depth study of how post-classical societies use the creatures from ancient myths, Liz Gloyne reveals the trends behind how we have used monsters since the 1950s to the present day and considers why they have remained such a powerful presence in our shared cultural imagination. So, welcome, Liz. Hi, lovely to be here. Thank you for having me. Just to start off, can you briefly describe the book? (laughs) in slightly less back of the book terms than I just read it. (laughs) Yeah, sure. I mean, I, so the way the book works is it's basically, it was written because I got fed up with heroes. Uh, I got fed up with the fact that whenever we look at classical reception, we're we're always looking at at the heroes in, who are in these stories, and the monsters kind of turn up, and of course they're there, and then that's that. But actually, when you start paying a bit more attention, the monsters have got a really big life of their own. And so, what this book is trying to do is it's trying to sort of shift the spotlight, as it were, and actually get people to look where some of the really interesting stuff in reception is happening, rather than being fixated on the homicidal white male who sort of is at the (laughs) centre of a lot of these stories. And so what the book does is it sort of starts out by trying to think about where do classical monsters fit? Um, How do we understand monsters full stop? There's a whole field of monster theory and monster studies that uh, I found myself plunged into when I started this. So it sort of tries to say, well, that's all lovely, but why are classical monsters different? Why is none, why has nobody bothered to look at classical monsters before? So that's what the first couple of chapters try and do. And, and then we go on the whirlwind tour of, so where are the classical monsters? We have two chapters uh, that are looking at film, uh, looking at monsters in film, and two chapters looking at monsters on television, 
one chapter is is the uh, first extended analysis of uh, Hercules: The Legendary Journeys that I'm aware of, um, from a monster <laughs> uh, a monster angle, and uh, yeah, the second chapter thinks about um, uh, Xena Warrior Princess and Doctor Who as sort of companions to what can happen when monsters get on the telly, uh, and then the last two chapters sort of take a a case study approach. Uh, so the first looks at Medusa and what some of the examples of what happens with Medusa. And the second looks at the last chapter in the book looks at the Minotaur, some of the examples of what happens with the Minotaur uh, in popular culture. Now, and, and, and I was never going to cover absolutely everything obviously because there's a lot of popular <laughs> culture out there so in some ways this is all mm-hmm. this is all sort of very preliminary mapping if you will but you know it's trying to sort of see some of the patterns some of the trends um what is going on uh, with with these monsters and why why is it still possible that we you know even car adverts right you you know you you turn on the television and there is a, a an advert for a car mm-hmm. or an insurance company or something that kind of expects you to know this stuff why is that still expected as part of this kind of cultural knowledge and what does that then mean for what's going on mm-hmm. with it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they can they can even just gesture at the, at a classical monster and expect people to know what it is and that that's an interesting point in itself. This discussion comes at a very timely moment for me because I'm right in the middle of teaching an ancient world in film mm. course. So this, I think, will inspire some useful discussion points uh, that I can have with my students. Yeah, you've just finished Hercules, your Hercules finished, session. Yeah, right? we watched a bit of uh, Hercules, the Legendary Journeys uh, just earlier this week. <laughs> it's a great, it's a fantastic show. Um, and I, I mean, it, it's really odd to me in some ways why, why more people haven't looked at it more. But on the other hand, I mean, it, it it's, you know, it's it's cable TV. It's a bit, it's a bit lowbrow, mm-hmm. she says, you know, lowbrow with inverted commas. Um, <laughs> and on the other hand, there is... A lot of it, <laughs> and so it, actually, just to get to get the hang of the corpus is is huge. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, there's there is just and when, so and when you much. Include Gina as well. Or... Yeah, I mean, I I I actually mentioned this. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I sat. Down, I have not watched all of Xena on top, but I did sit down as part of the book and 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 watch all of Hercules: The Legendary Journeys episodes. That's 111 episodes, each at 45 minutes. So that's over 80 hours of television. Right. If you want to be able to say anything meaningful <laughs> about like the whole thing as a whole, and I mean that that was that was a an interesting summer. Uh, when I sat down and did that, um, <laughs> and my other half sort of said to me, "Can you can you not like just watch them on fast forward?" I did enjoy watching it and watching you watch it on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me live tweeting on Twitter. <laughs> my the stuff I've been watching for this has been has been fun. Um, but you know, as I say, it, it's a big investment of time. And and if I hadn't if I hadn't been doing the book and hadn't been wanting to try and get get the picture of this, I mm. certainly never would have would have sat down and done it. So I can, I can kind of see why from that perspective you know it, it's not mm-hmm. nobody's done it but there are, it's it's a really really rich mm-hmm. i richly created world about you know what does the ancient world actually mean in that period and like in the, the 1990s when it's first screened what what is going on with what people think about antiquity and how antiquity mm-hmm. should be used it also has played a fairly major role in shaping a, a generation's view of antiquity too and of myth my you know my students weren't necessarily born when it was on, though many of them have seen it, but mm-hmm. perhaps the generation of students, you know, about five or t- five or seven years ago, perhaps a little more, maybe 10 years ago. But there was a lot of people whose ideas of myth were really heavily, and, and of history, especially with Xena, especially with the way Xena interacts with the Roman stuff and, and the early Christianity things, <laughs> where, when it gets really weird towards the end. Exactly. It's really shaped a lot of people's views, I think. I did have one student say, oh yeah, my dad loves that show. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> but I think this is why looking at the popular culture stuff really matters, right? Because this is, you know, this is the things mm-hmm. that do shape people's perceptions and the people who never set foot in one of mm-hmm. our classrooms or never never come to, to hear somebody talk or whatever. They see, they see this stuff, you know, in the cinema, on the television, and, and this is what they think the ancient world is sort of kind of about. Mm-hmm. So I want to just get back to that question, you uh, the point you made about how you were sick of heroes and, and how you know, reception focuses so much on heroes because not to call you out, Mark, because I did the same thing when I taught that course. Yeah. Um, but you know, that ancient world and film course is very centered around the heroes. You move hero by hero mm-hmm. in terms of, you know, I mean, it makes sense in terms of you've got eight 
films all called Hercules. You've mm-hmm. got <laughs> various films, you know, Troy and all these story ones where the, the, the obvious focus of the film is on the heroes. But it's true that, you know, that narrative is, it's also very cliched as an, as a Hollywood narrative or the, we would, Mark, you were just listening to that CBC ideas program about Joseph Campbell mm-hmm. and the way he's been used by Hollywood in particular and the problems, not only with Campbell's approach to myth, which is its own separate conversation, but also how like absolutely rigid the hero's journey has become as a story arc, you know, as like what we do. It's so frustrating. <laughs> when we tell stories now, and if your story doesn't fit the hero's arc, it can't be a good story. No, exactly. And it's so frustrating because ancient myth is not like that at all, as you well know. You know, ancient myth is which version of the story are we going to tell this mm-hmm. week? I'm going to write this poem, which references this really, really niche version that's known to like six people in the back hills of somewhere in Greece um you know <laughs> and 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 you're going to show how learned you are by getting my random reference you know i mean it, it's it, it's it's that kind of kind of fullness and, mm-hmm. and, and willingness to have the other stories. And then for that that hero's journey model, and Cat Bell has a lot to answer for, and I can be quite sniffy about Campbell. I think quite a lot of people can be quite sniffy about Campbell. Um, <laughs> but that's just become so constricting to those notions of what stories can be and where you can go with stories. Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, and part of the problem with Campbell, of course, is because he does want to Mm -hmm. venerate this kind of white male saviour developmental thing, which is in and of itself problematic, not least Mm -hmm. because the people who are being sort of stepped over and conquered are sort of the feminine other, the racialized other, all of that kind of stuff. And that, Mm -hmm. that has a big effect on who gets placed in the monster position. And then who is seen as the monster. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. then that becomes, you know, I mean, and all of this goes back to sort of a 19th century obsession with the hero, which sees the hero's sort of great conquering moves as as idealized in a in a world of in a world of colonial activity, right? Mm-hmm. And a civilizational as being exactly the the focus of civil civilizing activity. Yeah, exactly. You know, so the the the, the boys, and it is the boys who are being prepared to go out, sort of in the in, in Britain, and go and go and be sort of administrators with the British Empire, and sort of uh, tread the heathen under heel, are being fed these stories of the civilizing heroes, mm-hmm. and that mm-hmm. has a lot to answer for in the way that the hero has become. I mean, to me, quite this co- this toxic figure who's Mm -hmm. who becomes valorized for really rubbish behavior i mean take hercules Mm -hmm. for instance the ancient greeks know hercules is awful you know (laughs) people write plays about hercules is awful take odysseus Mm -hmm. i mean everybody knows that odysseus is you can't trust odysseus one way further than you can throw him you know they write plays about you can't trust odysseus further than you can throw him Mm -hmm. um but that kind yeah. of nuance of character and recognition, uh, sort of recognition of sort of the the fact that these heroes may have heroic qualities, but they're also very humanly flawed, goes out the window, and you end up mm-hmm. with very mm-hmm. simplistic morality tales, which then, of course, mm-hmm. further polarise that the monster has to be the monster and and fully monsterised without that space that there is in the original for some of those stories. Mm-hmm. And even when the story is sort of reversed and you know because that's something that more recent stories like to do the anti-hero or the monster as hero which does happen sometimes but all that happens is the monster now follows the hero narrative exactly you know like it's the monstrous figure but they still follow that arc it it doesn't that isn't any more innovative it's just and everyone can see it as the inversion and in the end still has to end up being the admirable character that we have as a hero so yeah i i grow more and more tired of that structure as the only way we can tell an adventure story <laughs> essentially at this point absolutely and i mean it's because it's grounded in those extremely problematic politics of campbell which you know are, are very happy to mm-hmm. say everything that doesn't fit my model i will just cheerfully ignore <laughs> there are lots of different cultural strands mm-hmm. that come together to those very limiting views on who gets to do hero in not great ways i think hmm Picking up on another point that you made a moment ago, that there hasn't been a lot of attention attention paid to classical monsters. Mm. There there has been a lot written about medieval monsters, and particularly a fig- figure like Grendel, who, hmm. by the way, does make an appearance in the last season of Xena. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I wonder why 
why medieval monsters have you know had that kind of attention, whereas the classical monsters. Yeah, because like, when you talk about monster theory, as you mentioned, yeah, like the big proponents of the or the ones I know, not that's. Mm-hmm partly because of what we know, but a lot of the people writing on monster theory right now are medievalists. Yeah, Absolutely. And that is because it was a medievalist, Jeffrey um, Jeffrey Cohen, who came up with the sort of the basic principles of monster theory. And that obviously, you know, when, when, when mm-hmm. the per- person in your field is the person who does the thing, <laughs> you know, that, that, that helps. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it does influence the field. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and of course the, the medievalists have got a ton of breveries and all sorts of other things, you know, the, the, sorry, the, the, the monster, the monster, the monster books. I mean, and they are, and they've got knight's tales and they've got all sorts of stuff that the medievalists can go happily and play with and explore. And they have been sort of very much exploring those kinds of things. And why haven't we done it? Why haven't the classicists done it? I mm-hmm. I mean, people are starting to do it in relationship to the ancient texts. People are starting to have these kinds of conversations. I mean, Dunstan Lowe's big book on monsters and Augustan poetry did that. Um, Debbie Felton's been thinking about this. Dan Ogden's been mm-hmm. thinking about it a lot. I think there is sometimes a bit of a a bit of a challenge, though, in thinking about how you how you do this in ways that doesn't become I mean, sort of I want to say facilely comparative because I think a lot of the because it's got to map onto a lot of the work that's been right. done with yeah. ancient myth cataloging. Yeah, it isn't, isn't just, just about, about cataloging. cataloging. Isn't just yeah. and also isn't just about saying well, other cultures had a myth like X as well. Let us try and work out the historical yeah. development of the myth yeah. of X. And it's like that's 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 one way of doing it, absolutely. And that's important in understanding the development of these things from maybe other Near East culture, Near Eastern cultures and that kind of stuff. Absolutely, that matters. But when it comes to the the, the cultural lifting work that monsters are actually doing in their own environment, that we're less good on and haven't paid mm. as much attention to. And I think that is partially actually and people may disagree with me here partly a question of genre because when we do look at kind of the the heavy lifting that myths are doing in the ancient greek world we tend to do that through the lens of athenian drama uh, we look at the stories that are told in Athenian mm, drama, which isn't very interested in not in at all. Monsters. It's inter- it's terribly yeah. interested in myth and myths import and why yeah. myth is relevant and all that kind of stuff. But you don't tend to get things that might require mm. somebody to dress up in the equivalent of the Doctor Who vac, you know, r- r- rubbish rubbish bags and <laughs> you know the the, the, the the toilet cleaners and, and hope that nobody's looking too closely. Or Doctor Who Minotaur, yeah, in fact, exactly. Which, you know, you, you don't. I think the Athenians could have managed just as good as those Harns of Nymon costumes, yeah. frankly. <laughs> This is true, um, but you know, as I say, they, they don't, they don't, they don't do that. They don't yeah. put mythical creatures on stage. No, they're very interested in heroes. Exactly, and I think that kind in the, of in the in the classical sense of the word. Exactly, yeah. and I mean, obviously, you get Oedipus, but we see Oedipus post Sphinx. You know, we don't actually see him the Sphinx at any point, though. No? So yeah. we we, we carry, encounter him there, but we don't mm. actually really ever see the heroes staged an Athenian drama uh, and obviously when you get into the poetry of course Ovid later in the mm-hmm. Roman period is our the metamorphoses is the tour de force from which a lot of later receptions flow even if there are previous versions I mean and it, it, it's the Ovid people read mm-hmm. it's the Ovid that creators read mm-hmm. um, and, and work with but I think within the field when we think about myth and the uses of myth it's that Athenian drama focus that often mm-hmm. we follow too which is, you know, yeah. uh, an unconscious shaping. I think. Mm-hmm. I was actually thinking that when we were talk when you was talking about the medieval, is that while there certainly are some continuous narratives that involve monsters, the Odyssey being an obvious one that survive, and as you say, the Metamorphoses. In fact, an awful lot of the monster stories that we have from the ancient world don't survive in a an artistic, like a literary piece. Um, very well. We we have mentions of them, like they're mentioned everywhere. They're referred to everywhere. They're in art and they're in our compendium, like the Apollodorus's library or something where he just tells the stories in the barest bones. But in terms of the more the, the literary works that we're used to paying attention to, uh, like a connected narrative story, it, similar to, as you were saying, a knight's, t- you know, one of the knight's stories or Beowulf or one of the stories that yeah. is really focused on monster slaying, for instance, those turn up in lots of medieval texts. But in the classical world, we only there's only a few of them. And even Ovid, yes, he has monsters in them, but the, you know, they're tiny little pieces. They're not the story of Medusa. Like, you know, our story of Perseus, how do we know it? We know it through 
minor, you know, bits and pieces in Pindar and bits and pieces here and bits and pieces there and bits of art and people have put it all together. So I think that might be why we haven't, people haven't focused on those because they're not used to focusing on those kind of, they're used to focusing on individual works and then whatever the themes are within those. Yeah. In parallel to that, I mean, when we think about, this is sort of a link in between our research and our teaching, perhaps. I mean, when we think about what myth is for in the ancient world, I mean, probably a lot of us think that myth is, myth is for myth 101, right? Myth is myth is like a, a grounding mm-hmm. taken for granted. Once you've got the facts of this, then you will understand what's going on in these texts. Actually, looking at the cultural labour that the myth is doing is 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 sort of a a step away from seeing myth as kind of a, a, a taken for granted cultural literacy thing that the ancient world has. Mm-hmm. If that makes mm-hmm. sense, yeah. You have to go on to the next. Like we have a. Th- a, a third year course that does theories of myth where we talk about how myth works in the culture. We have a first year course where there's certainly some of that, but mainly it's like, let's make sure you know all the stories. Exactly. Because you need to know all the stories because otherwise you're going to be mm-hmm. really confused. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. One thing I was wondering about was have classical monsters been sort of, had the tables turned on them the way that, because I know this is, has been done in, in sort of, in the pop culture based on medieval material where you've got uh, Beowulf retold from the standpoint of Grendel or whatever. Or Grendel's, or Grendel's mother, mother. in particular. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, both of them, in mm-hmm. fact. Is, to what extent does that happen in, in the sort of popular reception of classical monsters? It happens quite a bit, actually. Um, it happens more in literature than in film or television. It happens much more sort of in, in, in the literary tellings, mm-hmm. no- novels and that kind of stuff. And it does happen. I mean, the, the mm. um, fantastic example of this, which again is sort of Breaking away from that, you you have to tell it via the hero kind of uh, kind of model. Um, is the Minotaur takes a cigarette break by Stephen Sherrill, mm. which is all about sort of a Minotaur living in contemporary North Carolina and what it's mm-hmm. like to be a Minotaur living in North Carolina. Um, and 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 that's sort of a fantastic <laughs> sort of it's not quite magical realism but sort of a fantastic sort of dive into what would it be like to have lived for that long and be in this world and how does that work kind of thing mm-hmm. and this kind and the other i mean from from the medusa perspective actually there is speaking from medusa's point of view has of course become an increasingly powerful thing to do in the last couple of decades with the growing awareness that the medusa story is a rape story you know, mm-hmm. she is, and again, this comes. Of course, we've and got and then a, whole... a victim blaming story. Exactly, um, and of course, I mean, you know, <laughs> at, at this point, if you're feeling purist, you say, ah, oh, but Medusa wasn't always a beautiful maiden, and there's a history of her being an ugly gorgon before any other, other. And it's like, well, that's yes, that's true. However, most of the people who are creating are coming at the version that's told by Ovid, and that then turns up in all of the mythical compendia in Dolores, in you know, wh- whatever it might be. Uh, those retellings are all drawing heavily on the Ovidian version, which then becomes the canonical one for all subsequent engagements. So you have this awareness, this growing awareness that actually this story is not about Poseidon seducing Medusa, that this is about, this is a rape mm-hmm. story. This is Medusa is a rape victim. And as that has become more and more surfaced through acknowledging, through engagement, um, then stories told from Medusa's perspective become more and more powerful and more and more, right. they speak to that particular movement moment engagement that we're currently working through culturally uh, and that's sort of been a process that's been going on for the last I don't know 20 15 years something like that that those kinds of adopting mm-hmm. the Medusa position rather than sort of having her turn up as, as as the monster in the hero story but adopting the Medusa position sort of allows her to be reclaimed and uh, re-energized in some interesting and powerful ways I think mm-hmm yeah, I mean, it, it really is rich material, that story, you know, in terms of what can now be done with it, I think. Mm-hmm. Especially because it also has all the stories, you know, it has a, a very powerful legacy with her as the the monster for the villain, like the Harry Harryhausen movies and things like that, that make her just the villain, then give you that foil. Yeah. You know, everybody knows those images, so that gives you that foil for, for turning it around. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's sort of actually quite a powerful comment generally about what you can do with classical myth is that they do classical, the classical monsters do pick up resonances 
at unexpected moments. You know, I mean, if you'd said to sort of somebody mm. in the 60s, you know, guess what? The Medusa myth is going to be really useful for. They'd looked at you and sort of uh, not been terribly convinced. Um, mm. But actually, the different ways that the myths, the monsters find spaces to adapt to these modern concerns while still looking like the ancient monsters. I mean, that's what really mm -hmm. struck out to me is the way that the, the ancient monsters have managed to maintain their, their coherence within the ancient world without losing their sense of who they are which over 2,000 years worth of going ain't bad. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about just from the, the inverting the monster's point of view that Hercules' legendary journeys uh, does a fair amount of that in a very 90s way where there's a mm -hmm. lot of misunderstood monsters. Like mm -hmm. I remember the, the Cyclops is in one of the very early episodes. Yes. There's a, there's a Cyclops who, who's, you know, actually just being, he's being, what I don't even remember, he's being persecuted by the villagers or something because he's big and ugly or something. Yes, yeah, he's being persecuted, yeah, he's being persecuted by the villagers and he's hanging out with the evil guys basically because he's been misunderstood and the evil guys are the only ones who are vaguely mm -hmm. nice to him and even they're not very nice. Yeah, yeah, which is, as I say, a very 90s way of inverting the hero-villain trope, right? Just find a way that you, so that the villain is actually not a villain so now the hero can stand up for him and save the underdog and now everybody's happy and there ends up not being a villain even or or you know just some some henchman in the corner who just runs off yeah i mean and it's sort of a very uh, it's kind of typical of a lot of what we might for be want of a better word call social justice issues in these things that it's mm -hmm. all just about mm -hmm. sort of education if you sort of uh, uh, if you look at some of the ways yes. that racism <laughs> is handled in in these kinds of in, in even in the in the hercules the legendary journeys where the centaurs explicitly mm -hmm. are sort of stood in as a kind of civil rights parallel uh, there's one episode yep. in which there is literally an episode around a drinking fountain and being able to drink out of the drinking fountain. I mean, you don't kind of get like more blatantly paralleling than that. But, you know, you, you kind of have this explicit and, and, and it sort of does all basically come down mm. to that. It's all down to basically one person being very silly or several people being very silly mm. and misled. And if everybody only just thought about it a bit more and more, more sensible, it would be OK. Um, and yes. the kinds if of we all whole, just got to know one another. You know, it, it's all about very much about that personal, that personal, you know, if, I, if, if you just, you know, mm -hmm. if you just think a bit harder about this and it completely ignores, of course, what we would now talk about in terms of the wider structural factors of racism and other kinds of discrimination, which, you know, it's all very well. You can be a terribly nice person and still be racist because you live in a racist mm -hmm. society and you're complicit in it. And so, obviously, 90, 90s Hercules does not get this at all. No. And so those kinds of... <laughs> no, sexism or racism. It's all about just making sure that you talk it out with people and then it'll all be okay. <laughs> exactly. All of those underlying things will just magically disappear because we've had a conversation. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, you know, it, it's the, it's those kinds... That kind of thing lies behind very much that the, the, the monster is misunderstood. But I, I have to say... That episode really irritates me, and I shall explain for why. Because <laughs> you have this, you have this male monster who is just a misunderstood sweetie. Yeah, that's the second. Ep I think that's the second episode in the first series. The yeah. first episode features a she demon who tries to, well, who basically ensnares men and turns them to stone by sort of basically flushing her eyelashes at them, and it's sort of this whole, mm -hmm. you know, dangerous, un unfettered female sexuality has to be slaughtered and have a tail cut off and all the rest of it. So you have you have sort of classic dangerous woman in the first episode, followed mm. by nice guy, if only you talk to him. And it's like, could you be more gendered? <laughs> really? <laughs> Folks, can we yeah, just not? not? I mean, it, it, it fits with the larger theme of Hera as villain, of course, but... <laughs> Well, I mean, but this 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 Cyclops is also there helping Hera, so he gets a pass because yeah. he's a nice guy. And it's just, I, yeah. I mean, the, the sexual politics of the series overall, bit problematic. But the fact yeah. that it's expressing, I mean, what's really interesting about Hercules is the way that monsters express a lot of the problematic and interesting things about that particular series over the over the whole span of the seasons. Um, but right. yeah, those those first two episodes, it's just in a nutshell. I mean, you know, I, you could bang your head against the wall, you really could, um, and it's just so so transparently obvious. Go, oh, could you not do better, darlings? Could you not do better? The answer is no, because it's the 1990s. But you know, it's yeah. No, yeah. There's there's lots to love in that show, but it is it is hard to miss some of the things that are not to love. <laughs>
<laughs> exactly. A lot to love and a lot to lovingly critique. Let's put it that way. Yes. <laughs> So because we haven't, you know, had a chance to read the book ourselves yet, though, I am very much excited to do so. Maybe just another couple of questions about who who is this aimed at? Is it a scholarly book? Is it a pop scholarly book? Or, you know, where, who do you envision reading it? What do you envision it being used for? Hope. Well, hope, yes, in my ideal world. Um, <laughs> so I wrote this partly because when I was working on a piece on Harry Hasen's Monsters, I couldn't find the book to read, and that made me cross. Uh, that's normally right. why I write books. I get cross because I can't find them. <laughs> uh, in the best traditions of Tony Morrison, he said, if you can't find the book that you want to read, you have to write it. But um, <laughs> I mean, more broadly than that, I mean, what what was quite important to me about this book is that while obviously I want academics and people who are working on this kind of stuff to to read it and find it interesting and a useful intervention, I mean, really, it's written for folks who who enjoy who who've had sort of you know in the in the UK in UK terms, you know, their BA equivalent, you know, who maybe did their their history or their English or whatever BA and and who are interested in kind of what popular culture is doing and who like a bit of chunky nonfiction. Mm -hmm. So, you know, mm -hmm. I mean I, I want it to be something that, that I wrote it with the goal that it would be it would be sort of readable for people who like, as I said, yeah, chunky nonfiction is probably the best way of describing it. People who it's meant to be accessible, right. it's meant to be engaging, it's meant to be helpful for all of the dissertation, all of the undergraduate dissertation students who are now writing their dissertations on monsters and myth, because there are a lot of them. But it's also meant to be for people who have maybe done that kind of humanities study background at degree level and who who still like to have something substantial and 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 fun to read at the same time. So that's sort of really what I'm who I am hoping will read it. Mm -hmm. well, I think. I mean, I mean, think that totally makes sense because there's lots of people who want to have an intelligent, thoughtful conversation, not necessarily with other people, but with a book or whatever, especially about work they know that is popular works that they know. And they so they have some expertise on that end of it. And I think that's one of the wonderful things about reception is you can speak to people who, by virtue of maybe having read, watched all of Xena, for instance, are experts in a sense on that show. And then you can bring your end of your expertise to them and they can kind of meet you and and read a book like that and be like, yeah, no, I can I can think about this because you're not talking about a text I don't know. You're bringing other pieces to a text I do know. And so I can I can respond to it in an intelligent way without feeling like I'm just being exactly. At. Um, and, and because it's coming at it from from the monster angle. I mean, I, I, I think there's a there's a lot there mm -hmm. on. I mean, the, the the way that people love classical monsters is, I have to say, endlessly fascinating to me. Because when I was uh, when I was working on the book, I had people say, "Well, mm -hmm. what are you working on?" When that's slightly slightly daunted, what's she going to come out with? <laughs> Am I going to understand any of the next three sentences? The kind of way that people do when you're an academic, and you know they they right. are aware that you you might be a bit niche. And, and I would say, "Well, I'm working on this," and the. <laughs> Eyes would light up. I'd end up getting at least three examples of things. Have you thought about? Will you be writing about? Don't forget, you know, people's favourite monsters. You know, it, it, it's it's just something that really seems to catch people, and it doesn't matter whether they're you know in academia or either as a student or as a as as as, as academic staff or whatever researchers still. You know, everyone has got their favourite classical monster or example of classical monster, yeah. um, and and so I think there's sort of a real scope there for reaching those people who find this stuff interesting and, you know, to, to, to think a little bit more mm. about it. Exactly. I have a basic question we probably should have, mm. could have started with, but I'm going to come to it now because I know that this is something that's going to be on your mind, Mark, when you work on <laughs> the next video, which you can tell us about that. So what is a monster? Ah, oh, what is a monster? So <laughs> I think basically monsters can be the kind of monster studies, monster theory realm comes down to saying monsters are things that break categories. Humans being humans, we like to order stuff. Uh, we like to be able to categorize things and say, this is this is one thing. This is another mm -hmm. thing. I know where to group this third object because I understand which of these categories it fits into. This is how I understand the world. This is how I, I don't turn into a small screaming pile of gibberish by mm -hmm. all the information that's coming at me. I need to have nice categories. But the nature of those categories is always determined by the human, by society, the society in which you're born into, by wider forces. Um, so they are therefore always completely arbitrary. Some of them may be very sensible or, or sort of mm -hmm. seem totally logical, but ultimately the, the, the categorization of stuff uh, is completely arbitrary. 
what monsters do is they don't fit they jump over categories they trouble the categories Mm -hmm. Uh, i mean in terms Mm -hmm. of sort of the greek and roman examples most basic category you can come up with right human animal Mm -hmm. humans in charge logical doing things animals mute it's not subsidiary subservient to humans possibly wild and dangerous but at any rate not human right Mm -hmm. and then you get the centaur hi sort of literally mm-hmm. straddling those two boundaries literally sort of the the the, the you know at his at his midriffs right the, mm-hmm. the the boundary between human and animal being circulated through being broken every time the blood flows around the centaur's body right so that then sort of the monster then stands mm-hmm. as a troubling of that what feels like a very obvious categorization of you know the, the rational the non-rational obviously what the center comes to stand for in terms of sort of bestial bestial nature and sort of vast amount of sort of uh, hypersexuality and sort of naughty behavior associated with most centaurs obviously not chiron chiron is the, the teacher center is a bit different but you know uh, most centaurs are animalistic uh, sort of the, yeah the, 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 exactly can't be trusted with alcohol give in to mm-hmm. wilder passions all of that kind of stuff but their fundamental existence troubles that what looks like a very fixed human animal boundary. And as you sort of go further on, in some ways, you get monsters who trouble the boundary in terms of gender, um, who trouble the boundary in terms of sexuality from a heteronormative perspective. You know, that you stay inside the nice heteronormative boundary because if you don't, then the monster will get you. Um, that kind of stuff. What is Dracula? <laughs> Discuss. You know, all of these kinds of things are all about either policing the boundary that has been set or about poking the boundary with a stick and showing that actually it's not as firm as you thought it was. So really, that's sort of where monsters come from and the kind of work they do. And of course, once they've been generated, they then carry on doing other kinds of work. But I think that's sort of, I I would say that monsters monsters exist to make us think and question and to have uncomfortable conversations with ourselves, really. And I suppose that that kind of is the, the sort of mirror image of the hero who is also, you know, often figured as beast-like, like Hercules mm-hmm. or um, Enkidu in Mesopotamian mythology. But it's also troubling the boundary between human mm-hmm. and God, right? right? So they're demigods. So Gilgamesh, mm-hmm. one-third God, yeah. however that works. Two-thirds God. Two-thirds yeah. God, one-third human. Yeah, and math still doesn't work, <laughs> either way you put it. Or Hercules or, you know, most... most uh, mm-hmm. Greek heroes who are semi-divine. So they straddle a different boundary that in theory is not a problem, but actually is because it makes them unable to fit into human society properly. Well, they also have that... that but uh, they also are, are partial beasts. Partial too. beasts and have that excessive appetite thing, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Or excessive, like uh, Hercules is oh, yes. excessively... Well, Hercules uh, is excessive everything. He's mm-hmm. excessive in every possible way, including how many stories there are about him and how big he looms in the stories of her- heroes. Like, yeah, every yeah. part of him is, is excessive. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and of course, that's something that um, Virgil comes and plays with uh, in mm-hmm. his story of uh, Hercules and Cacus in the Aeneid, mm-hmm. uh, where, you know, Cacus, the, the, the uh, cattle thief, is sort of... The only difference, you know, realistically between between him and Hercules is that Cacus can do interesting things with fire. You know, so that <laughs> kind of question about which one is really the monster, as I say, is right there in the ancient sources. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Hercules is even being a cattle thief at the very moment that Cacus Cacus steals cattle from him. So <laughs> how dare you steal that? I stole yeah, exactly. it rightfully my first. Yeah, because the word, the reason I bring up Mark's videos is your next video, the mm-hmm. Halloween one. So this podcast will come out in early October. Mark, your video is planned to come out before later October, later mm-hmm. October that we're we're having a hard time with deadlines <laughs> these days. So we'll see. <laughs> it's going to be... Yeah, well, it's, it's going to look at, at the word monster and the concept mm-hmm. of, of monsters. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I'm not even entirely sure exactly where it's going to go yet, but the etymology is is kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. It's the, I, I guess this idea of warning. And, and looking. And looking, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, the mon- monstrum from mono, uh, from monstro to show, to demonstrate, a monore to warn, you know, and, and certainly in the mm-hmm. ancient world, mon- the, the monstrum was very much about portents. The whole of the Sibylline books, Roman periods, is what do you do when a monstrum turns up? You know, if you read through Livy, a monstrum mm-hmm. turned up and then we did a thing and the matrons traips to the temple and sang yeah. songs or whatever it was, you know, it required some kind of response to this sign, this visual 
obviousness that that something was wrong with with the with the balance of the world and that that idea of the visibility i think is also really interesting mm-hmm. because we we are classical monsters look like monsters you can tell a classical monster it's got two heads or it's breathing fire at you you know it's it's not it's not discreet mm-hmm. It's it's a very obvious thing to come across. Yeah, they aren't, it isn't Dracula. Exactly, which is really, really interesting to me because we have mm-hmm. moved towards these these monsters who are who are less obvious, you know, who 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 look absolutely fine mm-hmm. until it's too late. Dum dum dum. I mean take, you know, every single serial killer film for the last however many years, yeah. It, we we are now a society that worries about monsters we can't see which makes classical monsters charmingly retro in some ways because yeah. they are so <laughs> bleedingly obvious. You know, they're right there. Yeah. You can tell it half a mile off. Which again, still sort of, you know, so why, why, do we, why do we want monsters who are that obvious in a culture who are mm-hmm. paranoid the other way? Yeah. And, you know, there's that whole category of the transforming monster, mm-hmm. um, like werewolves or, you know... Mm. <laughs> but they aren't really. We don't. I mean, there there are a few of those in, in ancient myth, but mostly they aren't. I mean, Liz mm-hmm. is right. They, there are very few deceptive monsters in Greek mm-hmm. myth. Yeah, when there is a transformation, it's a one time. Yeah, and view. once they're transformed, mm-hmm. that's it. Now you always know. You can always see them coming. Mm-hmm. Um, and we mean, sorry, it fits with larger themes about the Greek and ancient uh, the ancient ideas that your inner self is visible on so if you're beautiful you're good etc the exactly. only person that that doesn't apply for is of course women um uh. so <laughs> helen and pandora but other than that we can always tell if you're a good guy or a bad guy by whether you're pretty or if you're ugly <laughs> exactly and so you know monsters are always sort of therefore knowable because they look weird and that is a sign we need to do something about it right and that mm-hmm. carries mm-hmm. on through that idea of the monster as the portent carries on through all the way through the Roman world and actually into the medieval period and beyond as well. Mm-hmm. That monstrosity is something you can see. It's only actually when mm-hmm. Mary Shelley, bless her, does Frankenstein that that starts to get shaken. I mean, Frankenstein is a mm-hmm. really clear literary turning point there. Yeah, because Frankenstein, the, do- the monster is clearly monstrous, but then he- she does that flip of, is it really the doctor? Who is the monster, or is it yeah. the creature he creates that's the monster? Yeah, and, and he, she's also really clever about the fact that there's explicit discussion of the fact that the creature, when the creature comes to consciousness, is like a newborn baby, he doesn't know anything, doesn't understand anything, and that it is the yeah. process of acculturation that makes the monster monster, the creature monstrous. She never calls him a monster; he's always the mm-hmm. creature. Mm-hmm. So you know that 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 idea that your appearance might not be the same as your in a moral position, and of course the fact that you know. There's very strong hints that the so-called hero is engaged in grave robbing and all that kind of thing. And he's also a rubbish dad. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there are all sorts of... <laughs> Not a great husband either, frankly. No. <laughs> For the few seconds he gets to try, <laughs> exactly. But you know, there are all sorts of all sorts of ways in which that 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 hero as the good guy is deliberately poked mm. with a stick. Shelley is very very good at that. Yeah. With the corresponding that the, the monster looking monstrous might actually actually be there, and that kind of decoupling of appearance and actual monstrosity that she starts carries on, and is why I think we're now at a place where we are petrified about things getting us that we don't know are going to get us until it's too late. Um, I have a, a question motivated by a class, a question, something that came up in class, my own class. In the Odyssey specifically, he is later for sure, but in the Odyssey specifically, is the Cyclops a monster or an extreme form of human, like a bad human? A human who does humaning badly. Yeah, no, I don't think the Cyclops is somebody who does humaning badly at all. I think we have all basically been conned by Odysseus. This is my feeling about the Cyclops. Um, because, because when you look at what... So Odysseus rocks up with his men, pops into the cave, mm-hmm. slaughters some of the Cyclops' mm-hmm. sheep, nicks his milk, yeah. nicks his cheeses. Then he, the Cyclops turns up and Odysseus says, Hi! Ignore the slaughter, yeah. guess friendship, and then gets pissed off because um, the, the Cyclops' uh, response is to slaughter some of his men. And yet what the Cyclops is actually doing is, you know, the Cyclops is breaking Xenia because Odysseus has totally broken Xenia first. And mm-hmm. you then, uh, actually, the, the what the Cyclops is doing is the Cyclops is herding goats and sheep and cheese making and mm-hmm. a very domestic settled activity so and, and then of course mm-hmm. what having had Odysseus say oh they're very wild very savage they're oh no and then what happens at the at the end of it all these other cyclops turn out of nowhere and and suddenly mm-hmm. it's like oh hang on he's not this random isolated fat guy there's actually like a community he's part of 
So I actually think that in in the Odyssey, you have Odysseus deliberately monsterizing the Cyclops Mm -hmm. and deliberately Mm -hmm. presenting him as a monster in line with all of the other monsters who um, feature throughout that narrative. But yeah, then when you come down to it, that narrative doesn't have that many monsters. The, the, in the Odyssey, we think of the Odyssey as being filled with monsters. And so this is sort of, we, I was talking about this in my race and ethnicity class. This is why I'm thinking about it in terms of where is he on the scale of humans at the Cyclops? Or is he a monster? Like, as you say, like that boundary crossing thing. Because um, really, the Odyssey has, you know, it has witches and goddesses. Uh, it has the Cyclops and it has cannibals, two types of cannibals. It has people who eat weird stuff. It has the underworld. The only monster in like an absolute certain terms is the uh, Scylla and Charybdis yes. are the only monsters. Everything else is either divinity or uh, if you don't count Cy- the Cyclops as a monster. So I was wondering, because you can sort of put them on the scale. Um, and this is where you come to that thing you were talking about of the othering of monsters and the who counts, you know, how do our narratives make racialized others into monsters or other sorts of things like that? Because one way of looking at it that we were talking about is how Odysseus travels around the Mediterranean and everyone he meets is basically like the Greeks, but special in some way. So it's not like they're completely different, mm-hmm. but they all, they're on a continuum of like how close they are to a standard Greek way of life. And the Cyclops and his kin are like the Greeks, but they're like a primitive form of the Greeks in that they haven't, as he says, figured out shipbuilding and how to grow, you know, make wine and properly take care of their land. That being, a, you know, his colonial approach to the yeah. land. And so in terms of doing humaning badly, they do humaning badly by eating another human. I mean, like whatever else Odysseus has done, I do think that the Greeks are fairly firm on like, if you eat another human, you've definitely done humaning wrong. Yes. Yeah. But, but, you know, it, it, there's a difference there. Is he a monster eating humans or is he a human eating other humans? And which of those is more monstrous? And that, anyway, that was a discussion we had in class. And I thought you were the monster person, so I'd ask you. <laughs> I, I guess the thing that sort of might also place um, uh, Polyphemus into the monster category and all of the Cyclopes into the monster category is his abnormally mm-hmm. large size. Because yes, being so on yeah, that being, monstrosity is visible. Exactly, idea. you know, being being unusually unusually large or unusually full, you know, having an unusually extra number of heads or limbs or whatever. These these are mm-hmm. all monstrous categories of sort of not matching the template, as it were. So I think he differs from mm-hmm. sort of the other the, the the human races who who do stuff wrong by being right. by, by, by the whole, being the whole race being exactly wrong. by being sort of physically enormous and therefore being excessive in the way that mm-hmm. monsters are excessive bodily but i think as i say right. i i i really think it's odysseus's odysseus's cunning speech that's that's got us there oh yeah completely um and i do i do push back on people who uh, want yeah to, no i'm totally yeah. on board with odysseus odysseus being the great spin doctor of the ancient world i'm totally on board with that as a as a basic approach <laughs> just thinking about like how is he how is he portraying or he or homer or whatever portraying the cyclops how would he be understood with if you if you believed odysseus mm. how would he be understood on that continuum is what i'm sort of thinking about <laughs> yeah i don't think there's an easy answer and part of that is because we come back to odysseus constantly through a lens of having seen the cyclops mm-hmm as this monster you know yeah, I, I think it's yeah. quite difficult for us to 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 game the nuance if that makes sense because right. i you know i'm not sure to what extent people listening would have picked up on just how badly odysseus has mucked up xenia in this context yeah oh yeah he's he's relying on rules that he's already broken exactly and that's a bad that's a bad strategy yeah the, 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 again these these kinds of questions these kinds of characters these kinds of figures encourage us mm-hmm. to explore how how those boundaries actually work in practice okay thank you that was, that was <laughs> just a very specific it came up last week in class <laughs> I was like I know who I'll ask about there we this. are <laughs> so how, how did you go about choosing you know what tv shows and films and so forth to include in the book and I I, I want to say that I'm personally delighted that Doctor Who is in there because I am a huge fan <laughs> That hardly covers it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, to some extent, when you're doing this kind of thing, you're always being drawn a little bit by what you like as a person. You know, I mean, there's there's no there's no point in me pretending that you know this is somehow objectively selected. <laughs> you know, I well, 
in terms of the television stuff, I mean, partly I chose Hercules and Xena and Doctor Who because I enjoy them. I'm a bit of an SF person, mm-hmm. you know, I like them. Um, Hercules, however, is probably, as my colleague Nick Lowe put it to me, sort of one of the best capturings of an extended development of the ancient world in television. There's nothing else like it. Yeah. So yeah. if you're thinking in those kinds of, you know, what does myth on TV look like? It's kind of a, a no brainer to think about it, um, mm-hmm. which is, as I say, one of the reasons I'm constantly surprised people haven't. But, you know, it's OK. <laughs> I have now. Um, now people can disagree with me and then there'll be a literature and it'll be brilliant. But yeah, so that hasn't, so that that was sort of an obvious one for that. Xena sort of worked then as an obvious, okay, so Hercules is doing something very specific. What is Xena doing differently or otherly or, yeah, and mm-hmm. partly because I wanted to carry on thinking about what Xena does with centaurs, given it's the same world. And and, and Xena does something mm-hmm. very different to centaurs than what Hercules does. And I shan't, shan't go into huge detail on that right now. But that was sort of a, a good thing to do. And then Doctor Who as being sort of a, you know, a very established sci-fi program, but representing very nicely the kinds of programs which might might pick up a classical monster for myth of the week mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so it's so it's not as in hercules as in xena embedded in the background world but you might pick one for myth of the week and it's not you know um either it is a retelling of uh, a story or um as in uh, the naimon uh, it's taking a monster mm-hmm. and uh, doing something entirely different with it so that mm-hmm. was sort of the the logic there uh in terms of the film chapters um again it, 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 it pretty i think it's pretty exhaustive the film Film chapters actually. Uh, the mm-hmm. first chapter sort of focuses very heavily on Ray Harryhausen because how can you not, frankly? Mm-hmm. He's such an influential uh, figure. Um, and then sort of trying to get represent sort of the phases that things go through. And, you know, quite quite easy to work with getting the overview of what's going on with with interesting interesting patterns and sort of what I really wanted to get at in the uh, the second film chapter were sort of the two trends of, of using monsters. One which is sort of in this, what we might think of as this new epic, the new Peplum, uh, the remake of Clash of the Titans, mm-hmm. the Percy Jackson films, mm-hmm. you know, where, where you're, you have that, get, it's that hero story again. So what's going on in those? And then mm-hmm. the, the second half of that chapter is thinking about what happens in films that, again, are a bit more willing to break away from those kinds of things and to do more inventive, free mm-hmm. things there. So, I mean, the two, the two I can immediately spring to mind um, are Pan's Labyrinth, uh, where the fawn is obviously at the centre of what's happening there. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, then, oh, brother, where art thou? which does some interesting things with sort of uh, both with the Polyphemus mm-hmm. and with the sirens in that kind of imaginative way, mm-hmm. that imaginative world that uh, the Coen brothers create in that film. So that was sort of what was going on there. When it came to thinking mm-hmm. about um, the the case study chapters, I mean, really, I just read a lot. I just read a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. And as you read, you start to, I mean, what I've I've really found quite interesting is sort of identifying almost certain nodes around which receptions coil there are there are points and there are there are moments at which mm-hmm. um, receptions seem to of these kinds of myths of these monsters seem to focus themselves. So you know, spotting those trends and sort of using the examples that I'd I'd gathered to pick up examples and pick up moments really, um, and to sort of not try and be comprehensive because that's a mm-hmm. fool's errand and not very helpful anyway, but to try and sort of map mm-hmm. some of the some of the points where receptions emerged i think was really what i was trying to do there yeah and i guess the the two clash of the titan films presents uh, a really useful opportunity to to compare how or to see how receptions of monsters have changed over the years well actually that is not in the book but that is in the article that i wrote before the book <laughs> which is in new voices of classical <laughs> reception <laughs> which is um what actually got me thinking about this this that was the article i was writing when this book wasn't there and thinking about you know what is going on in those two films because I well, my friend Penny Goodman was organizing a, a conference with her then colleague Steve Green on Harry Housen and the classics and I desperately wanted to do something and I had mm-hmm. I have no idea what I would give a paper on I thought to myself so you know sit down sit down and watch the films sit down and watch the films and see what jumps out at you and what I found jumped out at me was sort of this theme of 
the monstrous and the feminine and a close association with water in the original Harryhausen film. Um, and then when we came to write the papers up for publication, mm-hmm. sort of the peer review came back saying, can you talk about the remake as well, please? Because that would be really interesting. Um, and it is really interesting because you actually end up with a really different kind of spatial awareness of where the monsters are. Um, and monsters move much more into mm-hmm. the underworld and associated with fire and all that kind of stuff in those intervening years. Um, and it's very interesting those kinds of distinctions and changes monsters stop being about stop being feminized associated with with the feminine power and that kind of thing right. in, in, the, in, in the original clash they're they're very strongly associated with the goddess thetis and with water and with her revenge and all that kind mm-hmm. of stuff and then when you get into new clash it's all about the underworld and this very christian kind of hellfire thing which is all just a bit odd mm-hmm. So yeah, so that that kind of is all is all operating as well. So maybe I'll I'll just um, ask one one last question before I come on to sort of uh, before we start wrapping up, uh, which is the sort of question we ask all of our guests. Though as very often ends up happening, I think we've probably covered it already <laughs> to some extent. Um, do you have any particular moments in in this book or in other parts of your work uh, where there's been unexpected connections between different facets of your work or your work in your life or different interests uh, that have been productive? Mm. That, that's after all our, though we often forget to refer to it as technically the theme of our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I think... It, it's been, I think the sort of the thing that, that, that got me started on the project was the Harryhausen. Right. And, and that, for classicists of, of my vintage in the UK, yeah. we kind of grew up with Harryhausen films being screened on wet bank holiday Mondays. On You know, my, my parents had them on VHS tapes. You know, it was, it was sort of really part of the cultural landscape. Mm-hmm. Um, and coming to that has, coming back to that and, and thinking about it again has been, you know a real a real joy actually and sort of thinking about this this terribly influential material um but the the sort of other really weird and bizarre and quite fun intersection of what i'm doing these days is i'm thinking um a lot more in terms of space in terms of space analysis in terms of why it matters what what kind of space you are in when something happens which again came out of the harryhausen paper and that has some quite personal connections with me this is going to sound a little odd. Uh, my father, before he retired, worked in commercial property insurance. Uh, and that meant we were the kind of family who would go on holiday and uh, we'd suddenly be in a shopping centre and my father would say things like, we insured this. Let me tell you about these things that I saw when I came <laughs> on, a, on a trip around this building and you end up with a remarkably sort of thorough knowledge of this particular shopping centre's sort of fire, fire extinguisher <laughs> system or something. Um, but, you know, it... it that awareness of a building's shape and its design and its purpose and the way that it works uh, and the kind of family who sort of when you're walking around somebody say oh look at that interesting architectural feature up on that building you know uh, and actually that attention to space right. and to place has paid off in some really interesting ways in this particular project it's paying off um in the article i'm currently working on uh, which is all about the play Plautus's comic play Rudens, The Rope, um, where a seashore plays a very important role. And I'm thinking a bit about why the seashore is important, which is brilliant. But yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of finding mm. myself thinking a lot about space and place these days um, in, in ways that intersect really interestingly with some of my quite strong memories of being a kid on holiday and the conversations around the dinner table and all of those kinds of <laughs> all of those kinds of things that uh, sort of come back in in unexpected unexpected ways i think my favorite metaphor for this kind of stuff is sort of improvisation you know good, good improvisationary comics sort of drop a couple of things in at the start mm. of a routine and you kind of know a good improvisatory comic by the fact that those items come back in sort of a couple of minutes before the end or you know halfway through or you know the, these things keep on reappearing as motifs and yeah and this is this is sort of one of those nice examples of that in my life really that these kinds of research questions and interests and opportunity to think about them sort of keep on surfacing back up again in in really productive and interesting and curious ways but that's why we do our work, isn't it? Because it's productive and interesting and curious. Yeah. <laughs> Ideally, <laughs> on the good days. Yeah. <laughs> oh. 
Well, that's fascinating. Yeah, it's always interesting when something which is not what you thought you were going to care about necessarily at one stage in your life suddenly resurfaces as something that helps you with something you do care about and you find out you care about both (laughs) because that certainly happened in my life. Um, So then you talked about an article that you're working on now. So let's let's come back to the book and make sure everybody knows how to find this fascinating item. Uh, so this is, uh, again, the title is Tracking Classical Monsters in Popular Culture. And it's, it's coming out on the 31st. Is that Absolutely, still- yes. Right? Halloween. Uh, the press moved it forward, actually. It was eventually <laughs> meant to be the 14th of November. And then I saw they'd moved it to the 31st. And I was like, yes! <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Perfect timing. Are you doing any kind of launch activity? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, um, hopefully, we're going to be having a launch um, at uh, the Second Shelf bookshop in London, which will be um, really exciting because it's really excited to sort of work with supporting sort of a feminist bookshop um, in in the centre of London. And uh, that will be sort of in in early November. And then hopefully on Halloween, uh, currently sort of hopefully organising something with the Institute of Classical Studies for their traditional Halloween uh, (laughs) shindig, which uh, more details I'm sure will turn out uh, in due course. So yeah, nice to have a little bit of celebration and a little bit Mm -hmm. of uh, puff for it. The other thing I should mention is that um, I'm very, very pleased that uh, Bloomsbury are putting it out in paperback no. already. Yes, I noticed that when I went to look at the website, actually, and how cheap, frankly, <laughs> it was for an academic book. Uh, and that's great because that is always, always something that matters to people for very good reason. So that's very cool. And then are, do you have, not that this isn't enough in itself, of course, but are there any upcoming projects or other things you want to mention? I think at the moment, my main um, focus is going to be settling in on the next book project. Heaven help me. I'm on sabbatical this academic year. So this is the year that the second book, (laughs) the the third third book project is meant to be getting off the ground, um, which is uh, going back to classical texts, going back to Seneca, thinking about Seneca's tragedies and his family ethics, having done his prose and his family ethics in Mm. book one. So I'm sort of coming back again to to the ancient world. But if people want to keep up with what I'm doing, um, you you can follow on uh, the blog, uh, Classically Inclined, uh, where I tweet blog about the stuff I'm up to. And uh, I'm on Twitter, obviously, uh, as Liz Gloin. Um, and if you mm-hmm. are interested in classical monsters in popular culture, there is also a Facebook page for the book. Uh, oh, so if you put into Facebook, tracking classical monsters in popular culture, there is a Facebook page where, all as I say, it seemed a shame to have people telling me this is a brilliant classical monster in popular culture and not have anywhere to put it. So <laughs> the Facebook page is where um, more details about the launch and that kind of stuff will be happening, but also where these fantastic examples of what um, people are finding and sharing with me uh, go up. And we'll put links to all of that uh, in the show notes. Yes, so you can go directly. Um, and yes, Liz is a, a good person to follow on Twitter. I frequently recommend you when those uh, things come around saying, tell me somebody else to follow, <laughs> because you are both entertaining and illu- illuminating. And also the tiny joys are always make my my, my day better. <laughs> so <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> very kind thank you this is this has been brilliant and i i am really looking forward to the book coming out yeah you definitely uh well we should pre-order mark that's what we're supposed to do right everyone pre-order books it's a good thing to do (laughs) i haven't actually done it now but i will (laughs) um (laughs) tells the publisher we love them Exactly. Thank you for having me on. It's always really exciting to be able to talk about the book. And, you know, as I say, the, 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 because I want more people to know about it, this isn't a university library one, you know, because I want more people to know mm-hmm. it's out there. It's sort of really good to be able to share some of it. And yeah, so thank you for having me. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, again, you can find all the links for where to find Liz and her work uh, in the show notes. And we will and, and also keep an eye out for if you watch the videos for the video on Monster which will not unfortunately have time to be informed by your book because it will come out before your book, <laughs> but I am sure they will, we will be able to have productive discussions about it. And when we eventually do a podcast about your video in like five years, when yeah. we get to it, um, we can pick all of these new insights up as well. So <laughs> thanks again. And we'll talk to you soon online. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. 
Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensarah, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at Alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.